and welcome to workshop two in our series Working Well with Women with Disabilities. This workshop is around gendered violence. My name is Siobhan Gibbs and this was also developed and presented with my co-facilitator Erica. This workshop series was developed by WILD in partnership with Work Up Queensland and Queenslanders with Disability Network or QDN. Women with Disability were involved in all aspects of the development and facilitation of live workshops and the recording of these videos. I also want to acknowledge that we use the term women with disability in this series and this is inclusive of all women that identify as a woman and those women that have also have a chronic health condition. I want to thank all the women involved in this project for sharing their experiences and their wisdom with all of us. Before we get started, we wish to acknowledge the fact that we work and live on stolen land. We wish to pay our respects to our elders past, present and emerging. We wish to also particularly acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who contributed to this project, as well as their ongoing wisdom, sharing and support for our sectors. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. We wish to also acknowledge those people with a disability that have contributed to this project and continue to support our sectors. Their wisdom is invaluable and they are paving the way for more inclusive and accessible communities and services. So today we are particularly focusing on the topic of gendered violence and this subject matter may be triggering or difficult for some. So it's really important to do what you need to take care of yourself. Um, feel free at any moment to pause the video, come back to it at a later date. That is no worry. And remember, you can access support through 1-800-RESPECT. It's also okay to feel challenged. Um, this is a new field of working for many people. And it's important to acknowledge that we are all doing the best we can with the best intentions within the knowledge and context we work within. So it's important to acknowledge that as well and that we just do the best we can. So this is the second workshop in our series, Gendered Violence. And this is particularly targeted to sexual assault, domestic and family violence and women's health and wellbeing workers that work within Queensland. This information is generally nationally applicable. However, there will be some legislation and other Queensland specific things we discuss within this workshop series. And I encourage you if you are interstate to look at your own state's legislation or information just to make sure that it's accurate for you and where you work. So today we'll be covering a range of different things. We'll be looking a little bit at the history and statistics around disability. We'll be discussing myths and assumptions. We'll be talking about unique forms of gendered violence for women with disabilities, including chronic health conditions. We'll be looking at definitions and legislation. This is Queensland specific. We're having a discussion around dignity of risk versus duty of care, and we'll talk a bit around safety planning. So all the information discussed today, as well as additional information, is all found within your handout that's a part of this workshop. Um, and it's got a lot of resources, case studies and information that you can go and find out more for yourself. And I really encourage you all to have a look at those handouts after you've watched this video. A bit of a statistic. A person with a disability is 1.8 times more likely to experience violence than someone without a disability. So it's important to acknowledge that when we are working with someone with a disability, as we always do, we believe survivors, but particularly it is very likely that a person with disability will experience violence in their lifetime. And therefore, as workers in this sector, it's really important we understand how best to support them. So in the previous training workshop, we talked about the medical model of disability versus the social model of disability. And I talked about how the social model of disability is now enshrined in international law by the United Nations. So this is contained within the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities um, that you can find a link to in your handout to learn a bit more. But the article one defines that Disability is those who have a long-term mental, intellectual or sensory impairments which in interaction with various barriers may hinder their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So it talks about the fact that a person's individual experience is compounded by the fact that there are barriers and discrimination that exists within our society that therefore means that they have difficulty in engaging in everyday life. It's important to acknowledge that disability is an evolving concept. 
disability has been shunned and excluded from a lot of our sector, from a lot of our policy development, in a lot of our systems development. So as we acknowledge more and more so how prevalent disability is in our society, we are learning more and more how to shift how our sectors function to be more inclusive. Of course, acknowledging in that, because it is an evolving concept, um, some of the information in, within this workshop series may become outdated, and I really encourage you to continue to engage in disability services such as People with Disabilities Australia and Queenslanders with Disability Network and other peak bodies so you can make sure you're getting the most up-to-date information in your practice. It's also important that um, we take a moment to acknowledge the fact that our governments, individuals and organisations need to all recognise the human rights and the fundamental freedoms of all persons and that is inclusive of people with disabilities. And Article 8 of the Convention talks about the social model um, that all obliging countries, the need to raise awareness of persons with disabilities, rights to combat stereotypes, harmful practices and prejudices. Unfortunately, not necessarily everywhere in the world um, practices in an inclusive and accessible way. So it's important that we as a signing country, Australia, we ensure that we are promoting the rights of people with disabilities wherever possible we can. So Women with Disabilities Victoria um, have developed this fact sheet on the violence against women with disabilities, which the full version is contained in your handout or you can scan this QR code. But um, women with disabilities face unique challenges in seeking support for violence. So there are often risk factors such as living in institutions, being dependent on informal or formal care, that increases their risk of violence. Women with disabilities are also less likely to report violence or access support services, and their experiences of violence are more likely to be minimized, excused, or not believed. Women with disabilities are less likely to receive support due to inaccessible information and communication, physical barriers, and not knowing their rights. So it's really clear that there's been an absence of information that has access to women with disabilities for a really long time and therefore at this point we are really seeing a huge gap in our particularly sexual violence, domestic and family violence sectors where women with disabilities aren't accessing support or often they will access support for the first time through a referral from someone else that's become involved but they weren't aware that they could actually get help for what's going on in their lives. So I want to take a moment now for us all to pause and reflect. So pause the video and take a moment to think or have a discussion with your colleagues about what are some myths, assumptions or stereotypes you've heard about women with disabilities. And it doesn't necessarily need to be something that you hold yourself, it just might be something you've heard before. So take a moment to have a reflection on that and then continue on with the video. So I hope you've had an interesting discussion. There are many myths and assumptions about women with disability that we hear often within practice and also within day-to-day -day life. Often people position a person, a survivor with a disability to be at fault for their trauma and that reinforces the medical model of disability. Sometimes we talk about the fact that people talk about discriminating against women for not leaving violent situations and that's compounded often the experience of having a disability as well because there are so many of these unique factors that occur that will break down a little bit more. A key assumption is homogenizing all people with disability. So as we spoke about in workshop one, if we hear the term disability, that doesn't mean we have to to assume that they have the same experience as someone else we've worked with with disability. And also we can't make an assumption about someone's capacity or their support needs just because they identify as having a disability. And because these assumptions often occur, it means that services sometimes jump to a one-size-fits-all service delivery model for people with disabilities, which just isn't effective for everyone. It's, in, it's really important that we are aware of these myths and assumptions that exist, particularly in our workplaces, so we can address these and adjust our practice. So I really encourage you all to have a look at your handout where we've listed a couple of common myths and assumptions that are often discussed around women with disabilities. Um, and that can include things like 
a woman with disability needs someone to do everything for her, that they aren't able to take care of her children or that they have a low quality of life. These myths are just not true and that in fact these are just things that we project onto women with disabilities because of the assumptions and bias that we have as people within our society. So I really encourage you to have a moment to have a look at that handout to look at them more specifically before we continue onwards. Here is the power and control wheel, which most people working in the domestic and family violence sector would be very aware of. Um, so otherwise known as the Duluth model. Um, and this talks about how the different tactics that a perpetrator of violence utilizes in order to maintain power and control to continue the cycle of physical or sexual violence. And though these can all be in existence, in a violent situation for a woman with disability, there's also a few unique elements to the experience of a woman with disability experiencing violence. There's actually been a new power and control wheel that's developed specifically for this. So this is the power and control wheel for people with disabilities and their caregivers. So this more specifically looks at those care relationships and how perpetrators of violence who are also in a position as a caregiver can use physical and sexual violence towards a woman with disability. And this um, ranges with a whole lot of different specific forms. And we can see similarities between the previous power and control wheel and this one, but particularly looking at things that are disability specific, such as taking away a person's mobility aids or equipment, not providing personal care, or for example, using boiling water and bathtubs, um, withholding medications and food, also um, withholding transport support or sometimes physical restraints, leaving a, someone in bed for days um, and neglect. There's a lot of, there's a lot within this um, and there's a clearer version of this wheel is available in the handout that you can have a look a bit more specifically. It's really important to acknowledge that the power and control that our carer holds in a relationship, particularly with a woman with disability, is really significant and really nuanced. And as workers, we really need to understand how that functions and how best we can support the woman with disability who is experiencing violence. And really important to keep these community attitudes in our minds so that we ensure that bias and stereotyping doesn't come into play when we are hearing a woman describe her experience. Looking at domestic and family violence specifically for a moment, we're just gonna take a moment to look at the legislation that exists for Queensland. Um, and it's really important, particularly in this legislation, it varies quite significantly between states and territories. So please, if you're interstate, have a look at your relevant legislation because the Queensland legislation is very specific to this to us and how the act functions. So it's defined domestic violence as the behavior used by one person against another in a relevant relationship. The violence may be physical, financial, sexual, emotional, or psychological. And this can be in the form of threats, control, or domination, or anything that causes fear. So it's a really important relevant relationship. We're gonna break that down now. What is a relevant relationship? So the act, specifically says that a relevant relationship is a family relationship. So that's blood or marriage relatives, former relatives, or people regarded as relatives. An informal care relationship between two people, if one of them is or was dependent on the other for help in daily living activities, unless under a commercial arrangement, which may or may not include volunteers. An intimate personal relationship, married, engaged, or de facto. So I really want to take a moment to highlight the fact that this legislation ex excludes many domestic relationships that people with disabilities have, such as co-tenants, paid carers, co-workers, friends, etc. So sometimes that is a barrier for some people when they're seeking support because by definition the Act here doesn't actually define a paid worker as being someone in a domestic relationship with someone that's experiencing violence. And we acknowledge where the legislation sits because this obviously impacts whether a person can access something like a domestic violence order or other support that relies on the legislation.
if you're working with someone to report to police, it, um, it is helpful to have an understanding of the Act because often police need to work within the context of the legislation. But at the core of all of this, it is important to acknowledge that a person's experience of violence, if they are experiencing violence, is valid and a real experience and should never be diminished regardless of whether or not it is classified as domestic violence with the legislation. When we discuss domestic violence for people with disabilities, there's a few different, I guess, types of violence or forms of violence that are really specific to those that have a disability. And we're just going to break down a few of these now. As workers, we can often sit within a typical experience of domestic violence, but these unique forms are really prevalent and um, was something that when we talked in our focus groups that a lot of the women said sometimes would be overlooked, but particularly when conducting risk assessments. So when we're having conversations with people to determine the level of risk, the amount of violence that's happening, it's really clear that um, sometimes those risk assessments exclude some of these unique forms. So I really encourage you to ensure that these are existing within your risk assessments. So these forms can include physical forms of violence, so things like withholding food, water medication or support services, misusing um, medication as restraints such as sedatives, using physical restraints, um, destroying or withholding disability related equipment. These are all really common um, forms of violence for people with disabilities and sometimes not super obvious and sometimes too the individual may have never actually accessed this support because the carer has put a block to them ever getting things like mobility aids so that they're completely dependent on the carer and the perpetrator of violence. For sexual forms of violence, this can include inappropriate touching when caregiving, taking control of reproductive processes and demanding sexual activities. There's a link in the handout, but I really encourage you all um, to have a look around coercive control and coercive reproduction that Children by Choice and Wild developed a workshop. Uh, it's about a 45 minute workshop that's available on the Children by Choice website that breaks down really specifically um, reproductive coercive control, particularly for women with intellectual disabilities, but I think is really valid across dis the experience of disability as a spectrum. This is a very um, misreported, um, underreported area of violence. So I really encourage you to understand this one more particularly. Um, and also to the inappropriate touching during caregiving um, often occurs, unfortunately, commonly and a lot of women don't believe that they have a right to speak up against this, against their paid worker. So it's always important to explore all facets of violence to ensure that everything can be addressed if the person wants to. When looking at emotional forms of violence, this includes verbal abuse, forced isolation, denying or trivializing the disability. That was a huge one talking to women in the focus groups particularly around um, perpetrators of violence that were partners, often um, forcing the woman to exert herself or saying that you're exaggerating things, you're being dramatic um, in their experience of their disability that day. That caused them to become really unwell. Um, humiliation, threatening violence, institutionalization or withdrawal of care, that is something that also is a huge um, power and control um, method of perpetrators of violence, often saying that if you don't do X, I'll send you off to the aged care home, and you'll never see your family again, or the withdrawal of care, I'll leave you here, particularly those living in regional or remote areas, I'll leave you here and you won't have access to any support or anyone for days. So very frightening forms of violence that can be. And also threatening to hurt guide dogs pets or family members. Often pets and animals are a really significant support um, for people with disabilities. Um, and it's a very daunting thing when someone can threaten to remove that lifeline of support to someone. Financial forms of violence include stealing or taking control of money, um, taking control of investments, refusing to pay for essential medication or disability related equipment. 
something that we will talk about a little bit more um, throughout this workshop series um, are that sometimes people are appointed as decision makers. They may be a signatory on a person's bank account because a person with disability was deemed to not have capacity to be able to manage these things themselves and is a huge form of manipulation, power and control and exploitation for people with disabilities. And really important, when you are trying to do a risk assessment and trying to understand better a person's experience of violence, that we really um, break down these different forms of violence and signpost when we're changing to talking about something different because sometimes all of these can be um, existing in a person's life and we can make an assumption about what the dominant form might be. And finally, coercion and manipulation. So this is leading the person to believe that violence is normal or that they deserve it because of their disability. And unfortunately, particularly in our work at WILD, this can be something that's extremely common. And the realization that that experience is not normal, that it is not okay, that someone is being violent um, towards you um, can be a really difficult realization, particularly when someone's been in a position of power and caregiving for majority of a person's life. So it's really important um, when we are having these discussions that this can sometimes too be the first time a person realizes they're being exploited or that this is violence. So it's really important we give space for these discussions and we provide time and emotional support within all the context of having these discussions and particularly around these disclosures. Um, it's really key here to use this as a tool and you can look um, in the handout as well as on um, WILD's website around some more specifics around these different forms of violence that you can add to your risk assessments and I'd really encourage you to do so. So 1-800-RESPECT, um, you can have a look on their website as well, has a few um, disability specific forms of violence. Um, and it's really important too that, as I said, disability is an evolving concept, but particularly to the experiences of violence, abuse and neglect of people with disabilities is something we're continuously learning more and more about its prevalence and what those experiences are. And as the Disability Royal Commission, as well as other investigations into this occur, we will learn and evolve more in our understanding. So aside from some of those broadening um, forms of violence, it's really important um, to highlight some of these specific forms, such as threatening to punish, abandon, or institutionalize a person, threatening police or other services will not believe their reports, this is something that happens a lot. Sometimes people with disabilities are told that any um, discussion or interaction with police or child safety um, means that a person is in trouble. And often a perpetrator of violence can manipulate a person to believe that talking to the police will just get you in trouble, not me, which is not the case. And often there's a lot of work that needs to happen around understanding and relearning how they can seek support and that they won't be punished if they do seek that support. Some perpetrators of violence also monitor all social interactions and technology use, such as always going to medical appointments, being listed as their primary contact, and often people um, won't second guess if a person says, oh, I'm their carer, um, and sometimes workers can make the assumption to, oh, okay, well, I make, should make them the first point of contact, when in fact that's just a form of power and control. So it's always really important to make it really clear when you're working with someone who they feel safe for you to talk to, if you're talking to anyone aside the person you're working with. Threats to take report people to child protection and that their children will be taken away, threats to assistant animals, financial abuse such as NDIS funds, um, Particularly depending on how a person manages their NDIS package, there is opportunity for people to take advantage. But that is something that the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission are working really hard to ensure that doesn't happen anymore. But we'll talk more about that NDIS in Workshop 4. Abuse that focuses on the disability itself and stalking online or in person. So really important to ensure that we think about these disability specific forms 
but also any form of violence can occur within these situations for a woman with disability. I want to take a moment now to have a look at dignity of risk versus duty of care. So when I talk about this, um, it sort of is similar to the medical model versus the social model of disability. So duty of care, it perceives a person using the model medical model of disability. So that is often that a person, uh, often a worker, will perceive that a person with disability is unable to make a decision for themselves. So that I feel this obligation to step in and make an assumption or make a decision for them. Um, and it perceives that a person needs support in all elements of their life, which as we've sort of touched on, we can't homogenize a person's experience um, between others. And also that doesn't mean that we need to assume because a person has a disability, they need assistance in every domain of life. Um, and as workers, we can feel this obligation to step in when we feel that someone has a disability and needs extra support. But sometimes that duty of care actually means that we sort of diminish a person's capacity to support themselves or to navigate um, finding support and solutions. So dignity of risk then, looking at a social model of disability way of perceiving an individual. So this is the understanding that people have a right to take a risk. So um, my role as a worker in the context of domestic and family violence or sexual violence is actually to help someone make an informed decision and that I don't have to step in and make a decision for them, but it's my job to provide all the information possible so they can make an informed decision. For example, about leaving a perpetrator of violence um, or for example, reporting to the police. As we would with a woman that doesn't have a disability, we would never pressure her or make an assumption for her about what she should do. And that should also be applicable to people with disabilities. Um, talking with some women that I've worked with, they often feel like they can't share that they have a disability because they know that then workers are going to start making assumptions about what they should and shouldn't do and start making choices for them. Un unless someone has a formal decision maker in place, so that's a court appointed formal decision maker, that can be in the position to make that choice for a person. We should always be having a discussion and allow the individual to make that decision. And even um, in the case of a formal decision maker, often that would be a public guardian. That still doesn't mean that they have someone making decisions for them in every facet of life. So always thinking about an individual has the right to take a risk if they wish to. So in my practice um, at WILD, I predominantly work with people with intellectual disabilities. And um, within the context of intellectual disability and their experiences of violence, there are other unique forms. So I do encourage you, I guess, to Remember that when we're talking about these different forms of violence, that's still a very broad, broad, um, general sort of view of disability. So really having individual discussions and using those unique forms of disability we've discussed up until this point as sort of a starting point of discussion. So for people with intellectual disability, some of these unique forms of violence can mean that they're often reliant on, on care and therefore more vulnerable to threats by abusers less likely to understand their rights in relation to violence. Rights and understanding um, what you have a right to do and to feel safe is quite a, what we call an abstract concept. So we'll talk about that a bit more at, in the next workshop around best practice, but it's really important that we understand that all the stuff we talk about around sexual violence, domestic violence and women's health and wellbeing can be very complicated and the language we use is very complicated. So it's really important as work is that we support people to understand. People with intellectual disability are less likely to seek help. People with intellectual disability are less likely to have received sex education and therefore are often ignorant to the rights in relation to sexual assault or sexual activity. Even um, working with a lot of women with intellectual disability Understanding contraception, um, understanding their right to um, emergency contraception is something that um, a lot of women have never had the opportunity to learn or an opportunity to understand. So a lot of our work often 
needs to be working alongside a person to increase their understanding of their rights so that then they can go forward and be less vulnerable to violence. They are people with intellectual disability are more likely to be financially dependent on perpetrators of violence and social isolation may be intensified. They are likely to have a limited capacity to organise and access supports in a crisis and they are less likely to be believed. Now it's important when I say all of these things, it can have a really deficit tone, but what we want to do is acknowledge the fact that there are clear gaps in understanding or points of vulnerability that we as workers can support a person to shift in their lives. And particularly around crisis work or understanding, um, it's really important, particularly working with someone with an intellectual disability, a neurological disability, um, in some cases also a psychiatric disability, that if we're working in a crisis context, it can be even more difficult for that person to comprehend, understand, and make a decision. So it's really important to allow time where possible to often repeat instructions. And this is where we can utilize other people, other safe people in someone's support network to continue to reinforce um, what we decide to do for safety planning, for example. But we'll talk about that a bit more um, as we go further down um, in our workshop series. So I was very grateful as a part of this workshop series to work with Erica as well as some other women who experience chronic health conditions and understanding more so the um, experiences of people with chronic health conditions and their experiences of violence. So um, the exp their conditions are often and their symptoms are often under-recognised and therefore pose additional domestic and family violence risks. So a UK study found that fatigue and pain was the most debilitating but least recognised form of chronic health conditions. So back pain was the second highest burden of disease in Australia, for example. So because chronic health conditions are often not acknowledged and often not acknowledged the extreme significance of impact on a person's life, it therefore means people won't disclose it or they won't be able to seek support. So it's really important we have open discussions about not only if someone has a disability, but also more specifically if they have a chronic health condition. Disability support and medical systems exclude energy limiting chronic illnesses um, and denial and disbelief of disability often leads to hostile treatment, self-doubt or exclusion, distress around disclosure and stigma and emotional and physical isolation. Sometimes too when we ask, do you have a disability? It's a very broad question. So sometimes having more probing specific questions such as do you have a chronic health condition? Are there factors in your life or do you experience anything that makes it difficult for you to go about your day to day? And just understanding the nuance of someone's experience can really help you work better with them, particularly too if someone's not turning up to appointments or struggling to sustain concentration throughout an appointment. This can usually be indication that there's a chronic health condition at play. And it's really important that we understand it. And like we said in the previous workshop, that we make it really clear we're not going to stigmatize or limit a person's support because of their chronic health condition. In fact, that helps us work with them better. We're coming to the end of this workshop and we're going to look now at a case study with a client called Michelle. So you're a case worker at a domestic and family violence service. You're working a new case with a young Aboriginal woman, Michelle, who has three children, including one 12 month old. Michelle shared with you at your first meeting that she struggles with reading and writing. Michelle has lost her mother and father in the last six months who are supporting her to care for her children. Michelle's ex-partner has just left prison for the violence he perpetrated against her. So you call Michelle to confirm your appointment with her later that day and Michelle tells you her ex-partner has been staying with her to help care for the baby. So I want you to think now about these questions. So feel free to pause the video, have a reflection, a discussion with your colleagues, and then come back. So first of all, what are your concerns as a worker? How would you discuss these concerns with Michelle? And what solutions or support could you offer Michelle? So just taking a moment now to pause and reflect on these questions and then 
come back to the video. There's a lot happening in Michelle's life. And there's been some significant life changes for her in the last six months. And as a worker, we can identify her disclosure of struggling with reading and writing probably implies that she may have an intellectual or cognitive disability. And that's something we need to explore with Michelle. And also too, for some people, that might be as much as they understand of their disability, the limitations of reading and writing. And that's okay. It just helps us understand better as workers what we need to do to best communicate and best support them. It's clear that it's a huge concern that Michelle's partner or ex-partner has returned back to the home with the children and with Michelle, particularly after it being clearly evidenced that his violence towards her was very significant. It is important, of course, to flag the fact that if he is in the home, it would be difficult and probably inappropriate and not safe to have a conversation with Michelle in that moment about your concerns, but definitely something that needs to happen as soon as possible. It would be also important to consider, is there a current DVO in place that Michelle could breach him on for him being in the home? And sometimes too, um, people with disabilities, often the perpetrators of violence may have a disability as well. So when we start looking at things like safety planning and the language we use around that, um, it's really important that we ensure accessibility. So when we talk about how we can support a person, we need to ensure that they can physically access our support service, that we have flexibility, whether it be um, appointments at different times of the day or doing it in a way that is best suited to the person. It might be if it is safe going to the person's house or meeting them at their disability service in a quiet room. It might be meeting them somewhere in public. Whatever is going to be safest but also most accessible to the individual. It's important we have accessible information. Of course, always coming back to person-centered practice. What do you want and how can I support you? Always ensuring that we are accessing empathy and being mindful of leading or guided conversations or questions. Are there any specialized supports available? So for example, while there's a specialist sexual violence service for people with intellectual and cognitive disabilities, and we also do provide some domestic and family violence support, but we are very small and we are also very unique. So it's important to have a quick look at the sector to see if there are specialized supports available, but it's not always the case. It's also important to acknowledge that our intake forms and our intake structures or our early stage risk assessment and safety planning conversations often are structured and guided. So they have leading or closed questions. He hurts you, doesn't he? It makes it much more difficult for someone to give a nuanced, unguided answer when we are um, leading them to an answer. Often these conversations to a very fast pace, which makes it very inaccessible. So it's important to know that you can spread this conversation out across many sessions where possible or acknowledging where someone might not understand and always constantly asking for clarification and whether someone understands what you're asking of them. But we'll talk about that more specifically in the next workshop. And one thing I would love to highlight in this moment too is having easy read or easy English resources available to help someone understand these really complicated concepts. So to conclude this workshop, we're now going to listen to a conversation between myself and one of my co-facilitators, Erica, where she particularly gives us a lot of insight around the experiences of gendered violence for people with chronic health conditions. I really encourage you to um, listen to Erica's conversation, particularly because people with chronic health conditions it's an extremely underrepresented community. And I hope you learn a lot from Erica's wisdom. Welcome, Erica. Good morning. So um, when we discuss disability, often people will exclude people with chronic health conditions. What has your experience been trying to access disability support services um, and the disability community? Yes, I'm... Um the founder of the Brisbane 
myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome support group. And we have over 250 members and nationwide there's about 250,000 people with this condition. Mm. How this is relevant is that probably only 1% are eligible for the NDIS and very few succeed in getting the disability support pension. So a lot of the members are actually have no income, not even Centrelink. Uh, in my own case, the range of support services I was able to secure. Now, remember, I'm actually quite a proactive, determined <laughs> type of person. Mm -hmm. and I don't think it was easy. It took a lot of persistence. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, uh, it was through my friendship network. They referred me to knowledgeable doctors. And then when I became well enough about six months later, I was able to, to access social media. Before then, I was too unwell. I couldn't hold a mobile phone or even whisper for more than 20 seconds. So social media was a very key support because it gave me advice because this condition is very poorly understood. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. So friends and social media. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to move house about 13 times in about the first year and a half. So I used mm -hmm. Airtasker um, people to help me move house. Eventually when I got better, like maybe a year, two years later, I became well enough to access, okay, fortunately I managed to get on Centrelink New Start. But as far as disability related support services, I also accessed the food banks. Mm -hmm. Even though I was formerly an executive director in the public service, I lost all my money because of disability. So yeah, I stood in line at the food banks here in Brisbane. Mm. Uh, eventually, thank you to the social media peer support groups, I found out about, out about the Queensland Community Support Scheme. And through that, I was able to access um, subsidized house cleaning and medical transport. And then the last thing was obviously online shopping because I was not well enough to do my own shopping. Mm. pretty much it yeah and I think that's important for workers to understand that there's often a lot of informal supports in place for a lot of women with disability including chronic health conditions that need to be considered in those situations when someone may need to leave a violent situation and a lot of those supports sort of need to move with her to the wherever she's going for safe housing um, but it's a lot more than just support workers often for a lot of people. It's, it's a whole lot of different other things that are necessary. Um, I do know that in terms of the national groups, a lot of the members first check in with the other Facebook peers before they take action on anything, even if it includes moving house, because there are so many enormous physical and financial costs in moving. Mm. Yeah, this peer support um, through social media sounds like it's really been a really significant um, point of supporting you in your disability, as well as supporting a lot of other people. Um, like that's a quarter of a million people in our population that experience this, that um, probably a lot of people just unaware of. Exactly. I mean, there was a research piece done in the UK called Energy Impairment and Disability Inclusion. And in its appendix, it listed over 50 diseases that fall under that energy impairment category. Mm. Diseases listed on the International Classification of Diseases. And one of the findings was across all of them, the most debilitating symptom was fatigue. Mm. Even 
more so than a mental and an emotional distress. Mm. About it, when your energy goes, you can't do anything. Um, so it included anywhere from endometriosis to chronic back pain, AIDS, and a whole bunch of other conditions that are not very well recognized. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I think that that's also too um, a really significant thing. I guess this probably segues into my next question. Like, what do you think are some key factors that are contributing to the risk of women with disability who are experiencing gendered violence? So I think some of the outstanding hurdles and risk factors for women with disability compared to women who are able-bodied is really the fact that the mental or um, intellectual or physical disability is so deeply incapacitating. Mm. And because it physically and mentally and emotionally wears you out, I think everything in, in our lives becomes that much more difficult. Mm. I mean, because I'm also a woman from an Asian background, I can relate to the, some of the cultural barriers, but I really do feel that the disability side is so deeply debilitating in so many ways. Mm. And I think also, mm -hmm. in some cases, the stigma is a lot more unconscious. I think there's more awareness now about um, people from culturally and linguistically, you know, diverse backgrounds. But I think disability is one of those more latecomers in terms of dispelling stigma. Yeah. I'd, I'd absolutely agree. And I think we can see that, we can observe that in that the Royal Commission into violence, abuse and neglect of people with disabilities only started um, a year and a half ago now. Um, and a lot of the findings that are coming out in news articles and things like that seem to be sort of toward the broader population, that, um, sort of a revolutionary or a shocking sort of statistics but I think something that the community has known within itself for a very long time and probably still is really underrepresented the experience the gendered violence experience of women with disabilities yes I mean I'm aware that there's other like you know, LGBTQI communities face mm. but I think because mental emotional and physical is so all-encompassing you know, the fact that I couldn't even whisper for 20 seconds, whereas if mm. I was from LGBTQI background, I could at least speak. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I think, and then it's the intersectionality then if you are from the LGBTQI plus community, but you're also disabled, then that's when it starts to compound each other. Um, and that's important to recognize too. Often, I think a lot of people discount a person with a disability's um, other various identities because they just see the disability or that's the word that has the most stigma attached to it, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I guess in this workshop particularly, we're discussing unique forms of violence against women with disability including chronic health conditions. And what are, what, what are some examples of these unique forms of violence that you think that workers should be particularly aware of? Well, first of all, the one is that because the woman with the disability is so heavily reliant upon others, including maybe a support worker or an informal carer, that puts them, the woman, at great risk that possibly the people that are supposed to be caring for her are actually the perpetrators of the abuse. Mm. That is a unique one. Mm. I think also a big risk is the financial course of control aspect is also very dangerous because we have such high medical bills as opposed to someone who's able-bodied, that financial control has so many more severe um, snowballing 
debilitating effects. That's the second one. Mm. And then also, yeah, because the disability is so all encompassing of one's mental, intellectual, emotional, physical capability, it constrains everything. Okay, I realize women from migrant backgrounds, you know, they might not speak English, so they can mm. communicate in English, but perhaps they might be able to find at least an interpreter. But in the case of when I was so severely ill, I could barely even speak, even in my own native English. Mm. Mm. And I can imagine, like, reflecting on that time, Erica, it would, if that was a point when in your life you needed to seek support around gendered violence, like, it sounds like the barriers would have been overwhelming. Absolutely. Mm. Yes. I, mean, I mm. do recognize other groups suffer from, say, for example, trauma or they're isolated. But again, it's that physical, everything about one's very being all the way down to one's energy cells just aren't functioning properly. Because mm. so, mm. I'm not functioning properly, it's so hard for everything else to happen. Even the very basics of eating, sleeping, bathing, talking. Mm. And I think that's a huge thing that workers need to keep in mind because particularly in a, a mainstream service context, a lot of solutions or recommended solutions or strategies that workers provide women who are experiencing gendered violence, um, that is coming from an ableist point of view. They're not considering or adapting a lot of those things, particularly if someone um, doesn't have an identified disability that they're on the disability support pension for or can access the NDIS, then further often workers overlook that and don't accommodate that when they're thinking of ways, solutions for that person. So I think this is a really good point that you've raised, um, particularly the financial coercion and control, I think is something even when you said that, I thought that's a huge, huge factor for a lot of women. And that is something that the private health sector often can only offer the specialized support a woman needs. So an absence of additional income she may not be able to access the medical support she really needs for her survival. So. Exactly. And the other thing that's compounded in the chronic health conditions scene is that there's still a lot of misunderstanding that actually many chronic health conditions are a disability. So a lot of the traditional mm. disability support services like the NDIS, we get missed out. Um, and yeah. Yeah, because of that, it might be outright disbelief or it might be just un unconscious bias. And even within the chronic health conditions communities, quite often a lot of people don't even self-identify as having a disability. And so many of us don't actually access the services that are available. Yeah, absolutely. So there's that it's that and again that really all just boils down to the misunderstanding and stigma surrounding this term disability. Mm. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and then the further stigma too of the exclusion or the exclusionary way that the term disability has been used for people who have chronic health conditions. Yes, I mean, to give an example, quite often the common assumption of disabilities that you have to be in a wheelchair or you're blind with a, a walking cane, a mm. walking stick. But if one rocks up with, you know, endometriosis, it's not visible. Well, perhaps the community services, oh, no, we are disability friendly. We have wheelchair ramps. But for the woman with endometriosis or someone with chronic fatigue syndrome and they need to lie down, or someone who has what's called multiple chemical sensitivity, you know, 20% of the Australian population has that. Just even the fragrance of hand soap can give mm. them fear migraines. So they can't even go out because of that fear. So there's a lot of misunderstanding of what disability constitutes and therefore what supports are needed. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I think something that you're absolutely right, people paint a picture of disability by physical disability or disability they can see. Um, often, and often we talk about invisible versus visible disabilities. So for people with intellectual disabilities, chronic health conditions, other health condi chronic health conditions um that is often classed as an invisible disability and often workers can just make the assumption that a person is well and able to access a mainstream support without additional disability support um just based on how a person initially presents which is so dangerous yes and i appreciate but i mean i myself was not sure until i asked my peers in the Queenslanders with Disability Network, does chronic back ache, does asthma, um, are they included? And they said, yes, because according to the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, it really boils down to functional impairment. Mm. So if your chronic back pain means that you're not able to walk or sit for great lengths of time, then that is a functional impairment. Mm. And Absolutely. In domestic and family violence, it may be the key barrier against which a woman is able to flee. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, and I guess we've sort of touched on this, but is there anything in particular you'd really want to highlight for workers watching this that they you think they should keep in mind when working with women with disabilities, including chronic health conditions? Um, I guess, factors they should be considering when offering support? I think the real key ask is, okay, we don't expect every disability, uh, every um, domestic and family violence worker to understand all the different range of disabilities, including chronic health conditions. I think the main thing is, first of all, to believe the woman and to listen, don't make assumptions. And we're all subject to unconscious bias because that's our way of making sense of things. But mm. try as much as you can to be aware of that and put that aside. I myself suffer from unconscious bias in all kinds of realms. And I have to constantly remind myself, no, this person is a unique person that Absolutely. has various constraints and I'm, you know, I need to believe them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's just the core of all of it is believing the person. And when someone's sharing with you, their support needs to acknowledge those and ask, how can I support you? I think also for domestic and family violence workers, I'm thinking now more about those that are in charge of um, marketing or community awareness raising. I think what would really help encourage women with disability to even contact you in the first place is maybe in your website or your leaflets, give some examples of the types of supports that you offer to women with disabilities. The reason I say that is because we are so physically, emotionally, you know, mentally, intellectually, and financially disabled in so many ways everything seems that much harder. So a lot of us feel, oh, it's just gonna be hopeless anyway. They can't really help us. They're not likely to be an accessible office. It's all just too hard, so I won't even bother. Mm -hmm. It's probably similar in that some culturally and linguistically diverse background people think, oh, well, they're not gonna understand my culture, so why bother? But if you give those cues up front, saying, well, these are the types of um, things that we can offer you and more that might help encourage us to make that phone call. Absolutely. That's a really good suggestion, Erica. And I think having a clear example of where someone that you can relate to has access support from that service, it's less daunting than it's cold calling. Um, it's just like when you ask a friend to recommend to you um, a GP that they found was kind or supportive. It's the same deal. Knowing someone else with a disability as well has gotten support from them that's been successful is super reassuring. Yeah. 
Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you so much for watching the second workshop in our series. I want to particularly thank Erica for her contributions. And I encourage you now all to have a look at your handout to have a look at all the additional information we provide there. Our next workshop is Good Practice, where we'll be starting to talk more specifically about the ways as workers, we can work better with women with disabilities and chronic health conditions. I look forward to seeing you then.